Okay, everybody, we are live, and good evening, Internet, and happy Friday to everybody on this long weekend as we approach it here on uh, July 31st, 2020. Welcome to our little show. Live Long and Podcast is pleased to present to you again our, our next edition of Star Trek Radio Theater, our seventh episode. On this show, Star Trek Radio Theater, our team here, we reenact Star Trek episodes. I like to say our favorite episodes, but not always. Sometimes they're just... A, a random episode and uh, there are many of us playing multiple characters within this story so you, you'll hear some overlap and tonight we're doing an episode from star trek the next generation's fifth season uh their ninth episode a matter of time which starred uh, matt frewer or guest starred matt frewer as burling half rasmussen who will be played by kevin millard in our version this is from 1991 or 2368 if you're going by the uh the star trek universe timeline this is an episode in the script by rick berman who uh very famously uh ran star trek for many years the script editors kevin and ashley millard a uh, great job and uh thanks to everyone who uh who helps contribute to this the whole team here it's a big deal and we're excited to bring you this next read so we're going to read through the script with some sound effects and everything else so uh we will go off camera here as we go live and we hope you enjoy it all right let's get going fade in exterior space the enterprise at warp speed Captain's Log, Stardate 4539.4. The Enterprise is on its way to Panthera 4, where a Type C asteroid has struck an unpopulated continent. The resulting dust cloud could very well create a phenomenon not unlike the nuclear winters of the 21st century Earth. Commander LaForge has begun work on a plan that would counteract the devastation. We focus on engineering. Numerous engineering crew are busy working with Jordy and Data. Jordy looks over as Riker enters. I'm afraid the numbers coming in are already indicated climate changes, Commander. What kind of drop can we expect? If the Pentharid's spherical forecasts are correct, 10 to 12 degrees Celsius within the first 10 days. If it continues like that, their entire ecosystem will be shot to hell. And I doubt they're prepared to cope with the kind of cold that's coming. Come on, the Riker. Yes, sir. We focus on the bridge. Picard, Worf, and Ensign are in the, at the con. Would you join me at the bridge, please? Right away, sir. Are you certain, Mr. Worf? There was a space-time distortion, sir. And there is something back there. We passed within 300 kilometers of it. It's too close to be a coincidence. Mr. LaForge? Yes, Captain? Of one hour affect our, your plans? We focus on engineering. Not unless another asteroid decides to pay a call on Panthara, sir. The odds of that occurring, Captain, are extremely unlikely given the time frame. Thank you, Mr. Data. We focus on the bridge as Riker enters. Ensign, bring the ship about. Let's take a look at Mr. Worf's distortion. Aye, sir. Mr. Worf's what? The lieutenant's sensors detected a temporal distortion in almost in our current course. There's a small object back there that wasn't there a few moments ago. The object is 50 kilometers ahead, sir. Full stop, Ensign. Aye, sir. On screen. A view of a tiny multifaceted spacecraft appears. Dimensions, Worf? Approximately five meters in length, sir. Life signs? No signs of any kind. Our sensors do not penetrate the hull. Try hailing it. That's odd. What's odd? We've received a response, sir, but... Yes, Mr. Worf? They want you to move over, sir. Reply that the Enterprise isn't going anywhere, Lieutenant. Not the Enterprise, Captain. You. What are you trying to tell me? And as Picard walks back towards Worf, a drably dressed figure appears where he was standing. Whoops. Excuse me, Captain. But you were standing right where I needed to be. Who are you? Rasmussen's the name, sir. Professor Berlinghoff Rasmussen. Ah, this is wonderful. Actually, quite a bit larger than I thought. Really? Where I come from, every historian knows the bridge of old 1701D. Where exactly do you come from? Why, Earth. 
late 26th century Earth, to be exact. I've traveled back nearly 300 years just to find you. Space, the final frontier. These are the voyagers of the, <laughs> of the Starship Enterprise. It's continuing mission to explore strange new worlds, to seek out life, new life, and new civilizations, to boldly go where no one has gone before. focus on the ready room. Picard sits behind his desk while Rem Rasmussen paces, checking things out. Exactly what kind of historian are you? My focus is on the 22nd through 24th centuries, early interstellar history. You know, it was always believed this was on your desk, not here. Fascinating. Don't go moving it on my account. You can't expect me to believe that the layout of my ready room can possibly have be of any interest to future historians. <laughs> no less so than your legendary modesty, Captain. If I could describe to you what a thrill it is to be here, this is the original. You flatter me, Professor, but I can't help but wonder what could possibly have caused you to select me as a subject of your study. Even in this decade, there are far wiser and more experienced humans in and out of Starfleet. I'd love to tell you, Picard, I really would. But try and imagine what a young Caesar might have done differently had someone had given him a hint of what lay ahead. Or if Lincoln had been coerced into changing his theater plans. I truly wish I could be more specific on why you were selected, but I'm afraid the exchange of information will have to flow in one direction only. As Rasmussen talks, he walks to the door and paces out to the distance of the window. Five, six, seven meters. Ha! I was right. <laughs> We focus on the observation lounge. Picard, Riker, Worf, Beverly, Troy, Data, and Geordi are sitting around the conference table. Rasmussen is sitting beside Picard. Why now? Right! <laughs> if you came back to study us, to study the captain, why would you pick today? Why not a year ago? Or a year from now? Oh, I picked the right day, all right. Just wait, you'll see. Do you always sit there on that side of the table? Usually. Why? <laughs> it's, it's not important. Professor, at what point does time travel become a tool for historians? Now, now, Commander, you know better than that. I've studied a great deal about your century, including the fact that you're quite aware of the dangers of anyone altering the past. And that's exactly what I'd be doing if I were to divulge information like that. Tellurian Plague! <laughs> I beg your pardon? The Tellurian Plague! It was cured! I mean, did they find the cure by your century? Oh, it can't do any harm to ask that. Rasmussen looks to Picard for help. I realize it's difficult, but we must keep to ourselves questions regarding the future. Go on, Professor. I'll be preparing questionnaires for each of you. Please complete them at your convenience. If you're concerned about a possible breach of security, I'm sure your captain can make a determination. And thank you in advance for curbing your curiosity. If I had my assignment in on time, can I get a glimpse into next week's poker game? 
Rasmussen laughs good heartedly. <laughs> Mr. Data, would you escort the professor to his quarters? This way, sir. <laughs> Data and Rasmussen leave. What did he mean? He picked the right day. You know everything I do, Will. Deanna? It's hard to tell, but he is holding something back. Of course he is! All the things he could tell us! All the things he would like to tell us! It might be that. I don't know. What if he's an imposter? God knows we've seen enough of them! He is human. The medical scans have proved that, right, Doctor? He's human, all right! And there was a temporal distortion back there, correct, Mr. Wolf? Yes, sir. And no one can deny the ship of his is unlike anything we've ever seen before. The hull is made of some kind of plasticized tritanium mesh. We've nothing like it on record. At least not until now. Worf grumbles skeptically. <laughs> Mr. Wolf, I do appreciate your caution. I share it. Bring his vessel into the shuttle bay. Place it under guard. Yes, sir. I realize this visit is going to be a difficult for some of us, but I've examined his credentials, and everything seems to be in order. So I think we should extend him every courtesy. Including questionnaires? Including questionnaires, Mr. Worf. They all stand to leave. We focus on the turbo lift. Rasmussen and Data. The lift is in motion. Rasmussen is inspecting Data with great interest. This is really a thrill, Data. Like running across a Redstone missile or a Gutenberg Bible. To think, the Model T of androids. The lift stops and the doors open. Rasmussen and Data exit into the corridor. We focus on the corridor. Rasmussen and Data head for Rasmussen's quarters. If you're referring to the first production model automobile of the 20th century, Perhaps subsequent Model A might be a more apt analogy, since I am Dr. Noonien Soong's revised prototype. Rasmussen continues to check data out as they reach his quarters. I stand corrected. We focus on Rasmussen's quarters. Is there a problem, Professor? I suppose it'll have to do for now. I'll get you a list of the things I'll be needing, okay? Would I be correct, Professor, in assuming that you know whether or not I am still alive in the 26th century? Rasmussen ignores Data. He finishes washing and holds out his hands, treating Data like a men's room attendant. After a moment, Data catches on and hands him a towel. Ah. Since you seem to know so much about Captain Picard and the ship, I assumed that you would. Uh, it'd be best if you kept your assumptions to yourself, wouldn't it? Uh, yes, sir. Sorry, sir. Data exit, and Rasmussen looks after him, again fascinated. He sits back and smiles. Whatever his plans, they're clearly going just as he'd hoped. Captain's Log, Stardate 45350.3. We have arrived at Panthera 4. We can see for ourselves that the atmospheric devastation caused by the asteroid impact. We focus on Panthera Science Lab. Meteorologist Hal Mosley's large cluttered office has been temporarily transformed into a crisis center. Numerous scientists move from one set of monitors to another. Picard and jo Jordy are beside Bosley. The snow can be seen through windows. Picard points to a map on a monitor. We've located three underground pockets of carbon dioxide here, here, and here. Our drilling phasers can release enough of the gas to form an envelope which would temporarily hold in the heat of the sun. We've spent years, decades, trying to avoid anything that would lead to a greenhouse effect. And now, here we are about to create one on purpose. Less than 24% of your normal sunlight is getting through that dust, Doctor. If we can hold enough heat in with the CO2, that should give the planet enough time to mend itself. A worried scientist approaches. Excuse me, Dr. Mosley. 
What now? New Seattle's reporting a cloud depth of 12 kilometers. Two rivers, tropical rivers, are beginning to freeze. Mosley turns to Picard. We better get started before there's nothing left to mend! We focus on 10 forward. Rasmussen enters, holding a small pile of rectangular chips, and looks around gleefully. Look who's here! I hate questionnaires. Professor, come and join us! Rasmussen heads over to their table to join them. I hope I'm not intruding. Not at all! I'm sure you're the topic of conversation at every table in this room. As I promised, here are your assignments. I'm sure they'll be painless. Please try and complete them by tomorrow. He hands out transparent chips, taking time to hold Beverly's hand while he does it. Woo! Tomorrow? Worf is not pleased. Riker oh. gives him a look. Not a problem, Professor. You're all very calm. Is there some reason we shouldn't be? Uh, history always records where people were, what they were doing, when important events took place, but it rarely remembers their activities, say, a week before, or a day, or even an hour. Are you suggesting that an important event is imminent? <laughs> I, I didn't say that, did I? Please, just go on doing what you were doing and pretend I'm not here. They were all a bit uncomfortable, and, after a long silence, why is there no record of other future historians traveling back to witness future events? We're obviously very careful. As a matter of fact, a colleague and I recently paid a call on a 22nd century vessel. They hadn't perfected quarantine fields! You probably saw some surgical masks and gloves! Isn't it fascinating how everyone has different interests when it comes to history? Different perspectives on progress? Rasmussen opens a small finger ring, looks inside, smiles, and closes it. Would you mind telling me what that is? Just checking the time. No problem. Is something important supposed to be happening here? Rasmussen waves his hand, dismissing the question. No, it's nothing. Nothing. What about you, Commander? What do you see as the most important example of progress in the last 200 years? I suppose the warp coil. Before there was a warp drive, humans were confined to a single sector of the galaxy. Ah, spoken like the consummate explorer. Rasmussen looks around the room, as if he were waiting for something to happen. What is going on? Are you <laughs> expecting someone? Phasers. Riker and Rasmussen turn to Worf. I beg your pardon? There were no phasers in the 22nd century. Ah, you see, Doctor, our Klingon friend is a perfect example of what I was trying to tell you. He views history through the eyes of a hunter, a warrior. His passion lies in the perfection of the tools of violence. How delightfully primitive. We focus on engineering. Jordy and an engineer are at a console. As soon as we input this atmospheric data from Mosley, the computer should tell us how many holes we'll have to punch. He hands a chip to the engineer, who nods and exits as data enters. What have you learned about the tectonic stability around the drilling sites? Rasmussen enters, unnoticed. Couldn't be better. Our scans were all clear. And Mosley says there hasn't been so much as a quiver down there in well over a century. Aha, uh just the two I'm looking for. I've brought you the forms I need you to complete. Shouldn't take more than a couple of hours. Rasmussen hands Jordy and Data a chip each. We're kind of busy here, Professor. Tomorrow will probably be better. Data, we've got 23,000 thermal simulations. You think you could check them for anomalies? Certainly. Data sits down at the monitor and begins to punch keys as the numbers scroll by at great speed. Is uh, that as fast as he can go? Not <laughs> fast enough for you, Professor! Uh, there's little known about Data's efficiency, almost nothing about his part in this mission. It's a topic of great conjecture. 209 anomalies, all within acceptable parameters. Thanks, Data. You're here to witness this mission. That's it. 
isn't it? It'd be best if you just thought of me as a fly on the wall and went about your business. I will have your answered questions as soon as possible, Professor. As Data exits into main engineering. Data at Penthara 4. Jordy doesn't have time for this. He heads oh. to another terminal. Phil, excuse me. Your prosthesis. What do you call it again? A visor. Visor, right, a visor. You know, I have a picture of you wearing that in my office. How do you like it? It allows me to see. I like it just fine. You know, Homer was blind. And Milton? Bach? Monet? Wonder? Fly on the wall, huh? Rasmussen picks up a small pad and innocently drops it into his pocket. He follows Jordy. A fly on the wall. Jordy has rejoined data. The computer has configured the drilling pattern and specified depths. Captain, we've got everything we need. I'm ready to transport down to the surface. I'll notify Dr. Mosley. Good luck, Jordy. Gentlemen! Jordy leaves and Rasmussen slips a pad into his pocket. Who said these moments were any less exciting when you know the outcome? I know of no one who said that, Professor. We focus on Panthera Science Lab. Jordy and Dr. Mosley are at a large bank of monitoring equipment. The shrouded sky is visible through windows. The snow continues. Jordy points to a diagram. The Enterprise will monitor CO2 concentrations at six different altitudes. If all goes well, it shouldn't take more than 20 bore sites. Let's hope all goes well. The Forge to Commander Riker, how are you doing? We've gotten word from the monitoring stations. They're all online. We're ready when you are, Jordy. That's excellent. All we need now is an open channel to data. We focus on bridge. Open a channel, Mr. Worf. Prepare to fire at target one. The computer has locked in phaser depth calculations. Mr. Data. Ready, sir. Riker looks to Picard, who nods. Fire. The beam bores into Tundra. It is still snowing. The beam stops and is suddenly followed by another, which hits a distance away. Target one is emitting 2,000 cubic meters per second. We focus Target. on Panthera Science Lab. Target two, 1,600. Surface wind patterns all over the target are stable. You picking up anything at altitude data? We focus on the bridge. CO2 concentrations remain unchanged at upper elevations. It is snowing. In the distance, a hole is being drilled by the phaser. Then another. It ends, and suddenly a third shot. Rasmussen enters the bridge. Have I missed much? He walks into the command area and sits in Riker's chair. Target 14 complete, sir. Data? We focus on engineering. What have you got? No change, sir. Riker turns, notices Rasmussen in his chair. He's not pleased, but continues monitoring the situation at hand. <laughs> we focus on Panthera Science Lab. How are the surface winds, Jordy? Hold pretty steady, sir. We focus on bridge. The computer has stopped drilling. You should be getting something. We focus on engineering. Now, data? Elevated CO2 levels at 20 kilometers, sir. We focus on Panthera Science Lab. Now you're talking. We've got some new temperatures coming in. All thermal monitoring stations are reporting no further temperature drops. Correction, doctor. Two equatorial stations are showing slight increases. Mosley sees it's working and turns to Jordy. Thank you. Thank you all. You've all given us what we need. Time. We focus on the bridge. Rasmussen is still in Riker's chair. We're glad to be of help, Doctor. The Enterprise will remain in orbit and continue to monitor your progress. Picard out. You've given us what we need. Time. 
Ensign, return to synchronous orbit. Aye, sir. Very clever, Picard, and well done. We've always known how you did it, but to experience the moment, to witness the nuances, it's indescribable. Rasmussen sits back and smiles. We focus on sickbay. Beverly is running an instrument along a patient's injured leg. At another station, a boy is being treated by a nurse. Troy stands with Beverly. He's after more than a history lesson. I can tell you that. What is it? What are you getting from him? I don't know. It's like he's trying to confuse us. Misdirect us somehow. Rasmussen enters. There you are. Well, uh, that certainly was exciting, wasn't it? Professor! <laughs> is everything all right? Are you well? Yes, couldn't be better. Thank you. I just thought we might chat about your questionnaire. Buck up, crewman. You're a credit to that uniform. I've got some things to take care of. No, please, Counselor. I would very much appreciate your remaining. Troy remains. She obviously doesn't like this guy. Doctor, in response to my sixth question, you spoke of a neural stimulator. May I see one? I don't see why not. Give me a minute. Beverly exit. Rasmussen and Troy walk slowly away from the male patient. You don't like me very much, do you? I don't dislike you, Professor. They pass the nurse and child. Keep your eyes wide, soldier. You'll be telling your grandchildren about how you were there at Panthara 4. But you don't trust me. You should, you know. Should I? Picard's empath won't trust you. That's what they all said. Picard's empath? We're not that unlike, you and I. You possess a sense of... A sense that is foreign to the others. My knowledge of the future is similar. You know, some of my best friends are empaths. They trust me. Why should I, you care whether I trust you or not? We're birds of a feather. We're colleagues. You could learn a lot. We could learn a lot from each other. You're right. I don't trust you. I knew you'd say that. I'm sure you did. Beverly returns <laughs> carrying a neural stimulator. Well, it's nice to see you two are finally getting along. I really have to be going. Thank you. As Troy exit, Beverly turns back to Rasmussen with a warm smile. He returns the smile, but seems a bit shy. There's an awkward moment which ends when a nurse hands Beverly a pad. Beverly punches something in and hands it back to the nurse. Why don't you try a bear light scan? I'd be interested to see where his micro levels are. The nurse nods and exit. Beverly turns back to Rasmussen. So what else can I show you? You're a very curious woman. Beverly reacts with suspicion. No, no, I don't mean curious like that. I mean you're curious about things, about Beryllite levels, about the future. Well, curiosity is why all of us are out here, isn't it? I understand, but you're different. You're more... More vibrant? vibrant. That's, that's nice. I like that. <laughs> you know, whenever I travel back, I meet very interesting people, men and women, but I've never, never met anyone who gave me thoughts about not going home. You're supposed to be influenced the past, remember? Not supposed to be doing that. And I am beginning to feel a little influenced. Anyway... I could be your great, great, great grandmother. Rasmussen smiles warmly. We focus on the bridge. Picard, Riker, Data, Worf, and the Ensign are at their stations. What kind of questions did he have for you, number one? All he wanted to know about was previous starships. What I thought was innovative about the last Enterprise, the one before that. He said he wanted to see if we had a grasp of the fundamentals. His queries to me primarily focused on Dr. Soong's. 
an alarm is heard. Captain, I am detecting a massive earthquake on the surface. Another alarm is heard. Riker moves to an aft station. Two earthquakes. Location? Both epicenters are beneath the two southernmost drill sites, Captain. Is the forge still down there? Yes, sir. Find him. Worf starts pushing buttons on his panel. Another alarm is heard. We've got some volcanic activity. Pretty severe. Magnify. As the screen changes from a wider view of the planet to a closer view, we see huge volcanic plumes rising through the dense dust clouds. LaForge here, Captain. Mosley and I are on our way back to his lab. Are you all right? We're okay, but those were pretty big, sir. If this was on Earth, I'd say around an 8 or an 8.5 on the Richter scale. We're starting to see some volcanic plums, Captain. Two more eruptions, sir. It's likely that we overestimated the geologic stability around the CO2 pockets, Captain. We're in the lab, sir. On screen. And we see the interior of the lab. Everyone is deal busy dealing with the emergency. We're fairly well quake-proof down here, Picard. It's the volcanic dust I'm worried about. What about the dust? The ash the volca volcanoes are throwing into the atmosphere is going to be a compound to the existing problem. In a matter of days, there'll be no sunlight getting through those clouds at all. No amount of CO2 will help us then. Captain, take a look at this. Picard walks quickly to the aft station. Riker points to one of two maps on a monitor. These are the coordinates of the eruptions, and these are the coordinates of the phaser drilling sites. Riker presses a button and the two drawings overlap. The points are nearly identical. Picard looks up at Riker. Both men are aware of what has happened. The mantle is collapsing where the pressure was released. Captain, Dr. Mosley and I have a couple of ideas, but it's going to take some time to sort it out. Sort them out, Commander. Aye, sir. The view of the lab is replaced <coughs> by the shrouded planet with multiple vo volcanic plumes now visible. Lightning can be seen at the cloud tops. We came here to help these people. And look what we've done. We focus on interior corridor. Rasmussen walks by some crewmen and cheerfully nods. He goes to Data's door and rings the bell. The door opens and a bizarre cacophony of sound almost overpowers him. We focus on Data's quarters. What in God's name is that? Music, Professor. Music? Yes, sir. M Mozart's <laughs> Jupiter Symphony in C Major. Bach's Brandenburg Concerto Number no. 3. Beethoven's Ninth Symphony, Second Movement. Motel Vivace and La Donna Immobile from Verde Rigoletto. Uh, do you think you could thin it out a bit? Computer, mm. eliminate program one. Computer, eliminate program two. Another program stops. Rasmussen shakes his head again. Computer, eliminate program three. One of the four com compositions is silenced. Rasmussen shakes his head. <laughs> Only one is still playing. Rasmussen uses his finger to suggest Data turn it down. Computer, half volume. How, how the hell can you listen to four pieces of music at the same time? Actually, I'm capable of distinguishing 150 simultaneous compositions. And in order to analyze the aesthetics, I try to keep it to 10 or less. <laughs> Only four today? I am assisting Commander LaForge with a very complex calculation. It demands a great deal of my concentration. Well... I came to thank you for answering my questions, though I probably should have asked you to limit yourself to 50,000 words. You did ask me to be thorough. I realize it's hard to believe, Data, but very few records of Dr. Soon's work survived to the 26th century, so I would it would be invaluable to myself and other historians if you could provide us with some schematic? Certainly. As soon as my work here is completed. As long as it's before 0900 tomorrow, that's when I'll be uh, heading back. 
Bridge to Commander Data. Yes, Worf. Commander the Forge is hailing you from the surface, sir. Patch him through here, please. Jordy appears on Data's monitor. As soon as Data turns, Rasmussen takes a tricorder from the desk and pockets it. Have you rerun the phase reversal figures, Data? There were no errors, Jordy. The variance must be no more than 0.6 terawatts. Well, I don't see any other choice. We'll continue to run the numbers down here, but we'll come up with anything different. You better inform the captain of the good news and the bad news. LaForge out! Which do you suppose he'll be wanting to hear first? We focus on Ready Room. Data and Picard stand discussing the situation on the planet. The good news. The motion of the dust has created a great deal of electrostatic energy in the upper atmosphere. With a modified phaser blast, we could create a shock front that would encircle the planet and ionize the particles. That would be like striking a spark in a gas-filled room. With one exception, sir. The particles would be converted into a high-energy plasma with our shields could absorb and then redirect harmlessly into space. Turn the Enterprise into a lightning rod. Precisely, sir. And the bad news? If our phaser discharges off by as little as 0 0.06 terawatts, it would cause a cascading exothermal inversion. Meaning? We would completely burn off the planet's atmosphere. In orbit over the shrouded planet, the lightning continues. Captain's log, supplemental. While Dr. Mosley takes the Forge's plan to the leaders of the colony, I find myself weighing the potential consequences of a more philosophical issue. We focus on the ready room. Picard is staring out the window deep in thought. The door chimes. Come. Rasmussen enters. Picard continues to stare out the window. I imagine you know why I've asked you here. Yeah, I have a fairly good idea. I'm faced with a dilemma. There is a planet beneath us which is slowly turning to ice. And unless we do something about it, I'm told that in a matter of weeks, thousands, maybe tens of thousands, will die. That'd be a shame. Yes, it would. It would be quite a shame. So what's your dilemma? Commander LaForge has a possible solution. The margin of error is extremely critical, but if successful, there'll be no more threat. And if it's not successful? Every living thing on the planet will perish. So do nothing and thousands will die. Do something and millions could die. That's a tough choice. Not if you were to help me. You're not suggesting I tell you the outcome of your efforts. Oh, no, I'm not. Everything that Starfleet stands for, everything that I've ever believed in, tells me I cannot ask you that. But at the same time, there are 20 million lives down there, and you know what happened to them. What will happen to them? So it seems you have another dilemma, one that questions your convictions. Well, I've never been afraid of reevaluating my convictions. Professor, and now I have 20 million reasons to do so. And why did you ask to see me? Because your president presence gives me potential access to a kind of information that I've never had available to me before. And if I am to re-examine my beliefs, then I must take advantage of every possible asset. It would be irresponsible of me not to ask you here. However you come to terms with your beliefs, Captain, I must tell you that I'm quite comfortable with mine. How can you be? How can you be comfortable watching people die? Uh, let me put it to you this way. If I were to tell you that none of those people died, you'd easily conclude that you tried your solution and it, su and it succeeded. So you'd confidently try again. No harm in that. But what if I were to tell you they all died? What then? Obviously, you'd, you decide not to make the same mistake twice. Now, what if one of those people grew up? Yes, Miss Professor, I know. What if one of those lives I saved down there is a child who grows up to be the next Adolf Hitler or Khan Singh? Every first-year philosophy student has been asked that question ever since the earliest wormholes were discovered. But this is not a class in temporal logic. It's not theoretical. It's not hypothetical. It's real. Surely you see that. I see it all too well. But you must see that if I were to influence you, everything in this sector, in this quadrant of the galaxy, could change. History, 
my history would unfold in a way other than it already has. Now, what possible incentive could anyone offer me to allow that to happen? I have two choices. Either way, one version of history or another will wend its way forward. The history you know or another one. Now, who is to say which is better? What do I know? No is here today. One way, millions of lives could be saved. Now, isn't that incentive enough? Everyone dies, Captain. It's just a question of when. All of those people down there died years before I was born. All of you up here as well. So you see, I can't get quite as worked up as you over the fate of some colonists who, for me, have been dead for a very, very long time. Of course. You know of the Prime Directive, which tells us that we have no right to interfere with a natural evolution of alien world. Now I have sworn to uphold it, but nevertheless, I have disregarded that directive on more than one occasion because I thought it was the right thing to do. Now, if you're holding on to some temporal equivalent of that directive, then isn't it possible you have an occasion here to make an exception, to help me choose because it's the right thing to do? We're not just talking about a choice. It sounds to me like you're trying to manipulate the future. Every choice we make allows us to manipulate the future. Do I ask Adrian or Suzanne to the spring dance? Do I take my holiday on Corsica or Risa? A person's life, their future, hinges on each of a thousand choices. Living is making choices. Now I ask me to believe that if I make a choice other than the one found in your history books, then your past will be irrevocably altered. Well, you know, Professor, perhaps I don't give a damn about your past because your past is my future. And as far as I'm concerned, it hasn't been written yet. Captain, the electrostatic conditions are about as good as they're going to get. If we're going to try this, now's the time. Picard turns to Rasmussen. For a brief instant, Rasmussen's guard drops. His cockiness now has a trace of remorse. Please don't ask me, Captain. I can't help you. I'm sorry. After a long stare, Picard almost seems to smile. He turns and exits. Rasmussen innocently returns the smile and follows Picard onto the bridge. On his way out, Rasmussen takes a small pile of isolinear chips from a table. They disappear into his pocket. <laughs> We focus on the bridge. Picard enters with Rasmussen following. Riker, Data, Worf, and the Ensign and supernumeraries are at their stations. How long will it take to program the phasers, number one? We've just got to tie in Geordi's atmospheric sensors. So you've made your choice after all, and without my help. Oh, on the contrary, Professor. You were quite helpful. How's that? By refusing to assist me, you left me with the same choice I had to begin with, to try or not to try, to take a risk or to play it safe. Your arguments have reminded me of how precious the right to choose is. And because I've never been one to play it safe, I choose to try. Mr. Data, program the firing sequence. Aye, sir. In orbit over the shrouded planet, the ship is oriented, so the deflector dish is facing the surface. The lightning has increased. Captain's Log, Stardate 45351.9. Dr. Mosley has met with the colony leaders who all agree they are willing to take the risk. We focus on the bridge. Picard, Riker, Data, Worf, and the Ensign are at their stations as before. Rasmussen sits in Troy's chair. Warp power has been rerouted to the main deflector dish, Commander. We see Geordi and Mosley working in the lab. The snow is falling heavily. Keep those phases on active surge control, Worf! We're only going to have to have this shot once! Rasmussen almost can't control himself. Well, this is it! You have the sequence locked in, Mr. Data? Yes, sir. After an 8.3 second burst from the dish, we'll discharge all EPS taps through the phasers. It's time for you to return to the ship, Mr. LaForge. Mr. O'Brien, stand by for transport. Excuse me, Captain, but I can be a lot more help down here. 
We're going to have to compensate for density variations right up to the last second. Picard looks questioningly at Data. Dr. Mosley's computers can accomplish the same task, sir. But Geordi would be better able to anticipate unexpected variances. Mr. LaForge, you know better than anyone. There's no guarantee this will work. If it fails. There's no guarantee it's going to fail, Captain. I'd like your permission to remain here on the surface. Permission granted. The forge remain below. Good luck, Commander. Thank you, Captain. The view screen switches to an image of the planet. Continuous lightning flashes through the dark clouds and volcanic plumes. The deflector dish has been reconfigured, Captain. Picard realizes the time has come. After a beat, he nods to Riker, who takes over. Proceed, Mr. Data. Stand by for autophaser interlock, activating deflector beam. EPS taps online. Phasers firing. A wicked red glow quickly spreads through the atmosphere and is then pushed back into a single point by azure blue. A stream of energy leaps out at the Enterprise and envelopes it. Activating shield inverters now. The Enterprise rotates 180 degrees and pours the energy off into space. <laughs> we focus on the bridge. Picard looks to Riker and then to Data. Mr. LaForge? The view screen switches to the science lab where there's a guarded optimism reflecting in all the faces. The snow has stopped. LaForge here! Still breathing, Captain! We've got particulate levels right where they're supposed to be, and the sun is shining! You see, Captain, I told you there was nothing to worry about. Report back to the ship when you're ready, Commander. Doctor, we'll stay in orbit and analyze the remaining volcanic disturbances, but the best advice would be to let them cool down on their own. I'm getting in the habit of thanking you, Picard. Mosley touches a button and the screen returns to the view of the cloudless planet. Rasmussen stands and approaches Picard. Well, I'd love to see more, but it's nearly time for me to go. I'm tickled pink to have had the opportunity of witnessing this, Picard. And you did it all without my help. Well, must run. Got some packing to do. You know, you're taller in person, Commander. Rasmussen leaves and Picard gives Worf a nod. <laughs> We focus on the shuttle bay. Rasmussen, his phallus over a shoulder, enters to find Picard, Beverly, Riker, Worf, and Data by his vessel. Well, you, would you look at this? Who would have expected a teary farewell? I'm afraid we're going to have to take a look at to your vessel. Curious till the end, eh, Captain? Picard remains stern-faced. You can't be serious, Picard. We've been through this more than once. A number of objects have been discovered missing in the last two days, and if they're in your possession, then we would like them returned. I'm not here in search of relics. I'm sure they'll turn up. Rasmussen opens up his ring again, looks in, and starts toward his ship. Worf blocks his way. If you will not open the vessel, I will, with explosives if necessary. I doubt you have the means. If we don't get in that thing, I guarantee you don't either. Rasmussen shows the first signs of panic, but it vanishes, and he smiles. Uh, considering the sensitive nature of my equipment, I think you'll understand if I request that only Mr. Data be allowed to see it. Why Data? Because if I order Data never to divulge what he sees in there, he won't, with the exception of anything that might belong to us. Understood, sir. Back in a minute. Rasmussen puts his hand up to the ship. It scans him, and a door appears. They enter, and it closes again. We focus on the time ship. The vessel's interior, similar to its exterior, is truly futuristic, with multifaceted panels containing minimal blinkies. As Data enters, he immediately notices two large collector trays. Normally slid into a rack, the trays are exposed and filled with objects stolen from the Enterprise. I don't believe any of these items belong to you, Professor. Rasmussen raises a phaser at Data. 
nor does this. This phaser is set at the highest stun setting, and if I'm correct, that's that is sufficient to immobilize even you. Why have you stolen these objects? To put in a museum? Far too valuable for that. You see, in the century that I'm from, they haven't been invented yet. But this vessel and the temporal distortion that coincided with your arrival. Oh, this is a time pod, and it is from the 26th century. At least that's what the poor fellow said. You see, he decided to travel back to the 22nd century. That's my time. And he had the misfortune of meeting me. His clothes fit quite well, don't you think? Took me weeks to figure out how to work this thing. Then you are not a historian? More of an inventor. Up till a few weeks ago, a dismally unsuccessful one. What are your intentions, Professor? Well, thanks to your captain, it seems my intentions have changed slightly. I was quite content with the notion of returning with these trinkets. I'd invent about one a year, but now look at what fortune has graced me with. You will take a little longer to figure out than a tricorder, but it should be well worth the effort. If the auto timer is programmed the way I think it is, in about two minutes, we should be on our way back to a place called New Jersey. Oh, no. I'm afraid you won't be awake for the ride. Rasmussen aims the phaser at Data and tries to fire, but it only <clears throat> makes a lame noise. Panicked, he readjusts and fires again. I assume your handprint will open the door whether you are conscious or not. We focus on the shuttle bay. The vessel door opens and Rasmussen exits, closely followed by Data, who now carries the phaser. That weapon was working yesterday. You were correct to suspect him, sir, but he is not from the future. He's from the past. Picard reacts to what Data says and turns to Rasmussen. Trying to make my history unfold in a way other than it already has, eh, Professor? This was just all a misunderstanding, Picard. Just let me back in there and we'll forget the whole thing. Now, what possible incentive could anyone offer me to allow that? I believe you will find all of the missing items in the vessel, sir. Riker nods to Worf, who acknowledges and heads into the vessel. Rasmussen turns to Beverly with a desperate, pleading look. Doctor? A very nice performance! Not all of it. Some of it was real. Beverly's cold stare tells him he's wasting his time. He checks his ring and turns towards Picard, panicky. Captain! He claims to be a 22nd century inventor, Captain. A pity you weren't a bit more inventive. If fewer things had disappeared, we might never have suspected you. As it was, the only stumbling block was your ship. Our sensors couldn't penetrate it. But once the door was open, the computer was able to detect and de deactivate everything you'd stolen, including this. Picard drops the phaser onto the top tray as Worf passes him. Worf hands the trays to the security guard. I'd love to hear more, Picard, but I really must get back in that pod. Rasmussen heads for the vessel, but is stopped by Worf. Picard looks to Ry Riker. Take him to the detention cell, Mr. Worf. Notify Starfleet that we'll be dropping him off at Starbase 214. Aye, sir. You can't do this. I've got to get back. I don't belong here. The tiny ship suddenly glows, shimmers, and disappears. Rasmussen can't believe it. No! no! <laughs> I'm sure there are more than a few legitimate historians at Starfleet who will be very eager to meet a human from your era. Worf and Rasmussen reach the exit. <laughs> Oh, Professor, welcome to the 24th century. The end. All right. <laughs> oh my God, the Knight Rider music. <laughs> okay, okay. So let's come back in. And that, that concludes our reading of A Matter of Time from the Next Generation here on Star Trek Radio Theater 
on a Friday night live performance. I want to introduce our cast. Uh, well, hey, um, if you don't mind, everybody, I'm going to bring in Jeff next because he's the only one who's in remote and not here in the room with us. Uh, let's get him up here on screen. Hey, Jeff, how are you doing? Good, good. You were playing the parts of um, Jordy LaForge, Lieutenant Worf, and uh, Deanna Troy. And also here in the room, uh, well, here, I got one. I have, a, I have another camera here to bring in. Uh, Jane playing the part of Captain Picard. How are you doing, Jane? All right. And then behind me, you can see here, we got Ashley Millard, who was the narrator and Commander Riker. And then here we have Kevin Millard, who was playing the part of uh, Rasmussen, Ber or Ber Berlinhoff Rasmussen. Uh, great job, Kevin. Like, <laughs> So this was Kevin's second time being on the radio theater with us. And he said, okay, I'll just take the one role. It ended up being the role with like a ton of dialogue. and 30% of the lines. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and Jane had a ton of dialogue in this yeah. one, too. Uh, this was your second time playing the captain. Um, <clears throat> hey, can you say in your Riker voice, <laughs> no. hey, boo-boo. Hey, boo-boo. <laughs> How about a picnic basket? <laughs> that was totally Yogi Bear. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it was. <laughs> yeah. I had a lot of fun with that one. That one um, was good. Uh, I apologize for Data. I feel like I should have done better with Data, but... <laughs> I think he served his purpose, uh, but he wasn't necessarily as uh, wacky as I make most of my characters. But um, you I think will apologize. It's hilarious. Yeah, well, <laughs> that was it. I could have done better with that something. Um, but I hope you liked my Crusher and my Mosley. Oh, my <laughs> days! <laughs> Sorry. Good. Oh yeah, your prospector was good. My old man Mosley, I will be thanking you again, Picard, all the time. <laughs> you were Deckard Kane from Diablo 2. <laughs> stay a while and listen. <laughs> yeah, stay a while and listen. Uh, or, uh, or my Beverly Crusher. A man. Beverly Crusher. Yeah, that was fun. Uh, great job, everybody. Everyone did fantastic with their parts and uh, the dialogue. And uh, This was a smaller cast than we're, we've been doing lately because we've had Nightingale and Michael. They're off for a couple weeks well, so we're, we're, you know, we'll keep trucking on. It gives us a few more characters each uh, in, in, or a little, at least a little more dialogue. Um, so yeah. Everyone felt good? Yeah. yeah. Good, good. Yes. Alright, well we're going to get... I lost my place at one point because I was laughing oh, yeah, at the, Troy. The <laughs> Troy and... <laughs> The difference between Troy and Crusher when they were talking was great. I have to be going. <laughs> <laughs> we, we need to do. We need to bring the reprise those characters. Where, like it's like uh, Troy Crusher girl time. Uh, uh, <laughs> so uh, I, I, I'm looking forward to that. Maybe when we, if we ever do the Space Ghost and the candle, Space Ghost, yeah, Sub Rose, Space and, Ghost, yeah, 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 that would be good. Uh, Phyllis Millard, our biggest fan. Uh, says another great episode. Everyone was awesome. Thanks, and you're very welcome. Thank you. Thanks, Thank, you. Thank you for watching. We appreciate it. Uh, you know, and our parents, we're 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 working our parents up to the uh, to to listening, but it's um, <laughs> they're a little resistant to it. Yeah, my dad. They're pretty, before, but yeah, they're stuck in their ways when it comes to their entertainment. Yes, they're like, what? Can I get it on the TV? <laughs> that's like, I need to watch. Yeah, is it is, is it a regular program thing? Is that your dad? Yeah, that's my dad. <laughs> I know how to work this. Um, <laughs> Jeff, all your characters uh, done so well. Worf always been her fave, and he's my fave too. Right? Thank you. Yeah. Oh, thank you. <laughs> yes. Uh, awesome. Yeah, no, so I'm really looking forward to whatever the next one is. We won't know till after. We're going to usually we just spin the wheel. Um, I think we're going to probably either DS9 or TNG likely um, uh, for, for the next one. And um, if you ever have a, a, a favorite episode, you really want us to do this one, just let us know. Uh, if you have any suggestions, comments, whatever, and make sure to subscribe and uh, you know check us out. We're trying to do this uh, this radio theater once a week. We're probably gonna you know take a break somewhere near the end of the year and then come back for a season two later on. Uh, I just want to plug all our other shows. On Tuesday nights, we do Star Trek uh, D Space Nine rewatches right through every episode. So we're almost near the end of season one. On Thursday nights, we do original series rewatches uh, with my dad and uh, a whole bunch of other people over there. Um, and on tri uh, sorry, Trivial Debates is our debate show. That's a separate channel that's uh, at the end of each month. And we have Super Mater Brothers Podcasting, where we talk about reality uh, and scripted TV shows. Uh, 
and Big Brother might be coming back. It looks like Big Brother's coming back next week, U.S., so uh, we might be getting into that. We'll have to see. And Knee Jerk Sports, which is uh, Jeff and Adam's uh, sports channel. So make sure to subscribe to all those. Uh, listen to us uh, wherever you can. We appreciate the support. We appreciate the any kind of um, interaction and, uh, and all that. We really love it. We really love doing this. So thank you to all of our performers tonight. You all did great again. And uh, we'll see you next week. All right. Live long in podcast.